So what? I am scrolling on my phone and I come across this meme or something. And it was some Dolly Parton thing. It was about masks, KN95, working nine to five, whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I'm sitting there going, working nine to five by myself. And then it mm-hmm. triggered Elvis for some reason in my head. So I had just sent Gabe a message or I was about to or something. Some reason I had some shit pulled up for her on my phone. I'm walking around the house and I'm doing the thing that we all do when we're alone. I'm engaging with myself and I get a FaceTime from Gabe. I'm like, hey, what's up? (laughs) She's like, you just butt dialed me and I had to call you back because you were really giving it singing Hound Dog. (laughs) (laughs) And then I went back immediately to the previous five seconds of my life. And I was I was giving it hard. I was like, yeah, I know about it. Like by myself doing my laundry and shit. And then when it got to the point where he's like, you ain't never caught a rabbit and you ain't no friend. And he was like, I could feel I could hear her feet go like tapping on the ground. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. You were oh giving it up. You were giving it your all. It was great. Oh my God. You see, usually when I get butt dials, it's just like muffled. Like I've gotten butt dials from you and it's like in your purse, you know? Yeah. This was the most clear. I was carrying my phone around. I was like, I was holding it, but I was carrying a bunch of other stuff. So I must have hit the FaceTime button and not realized it, obviously. I think we're alone now. You never are. <laughs> I'm always with you, Tasha. <laughs> it was great though. And then we both made fun of me a little bit and we moved on. Oh my God. Okay. Let's welcome to SVU pod, especially heinous. I'm Tasha. I'm Gabe. We're on season three, episode 17 surveillance. Mm -hmm. I need to know your thoughts before we get into this. About what? The episode about climate change, about the episode. Mm, Well, we're just fucked. I mean, I know tides are, I, I mean, I don't know. What do you mean? Like, I think I thought it was bananas. I was so excited about this episode. I am excited about it. Yeah. I thought it was fantastic. Oh, it had me at the edge of my seat the entire time really yeah i was like oh it's totally this nope it's totally that nope but all of the transitions made sense and everyone had a wild life they were living behind the scenes (laughs) everybody (laughs) yeah i guess yeah nobody's just like a pleasant little woman who likes to bake and crochet and has her book club and shit like nobody that they run into they're yeah. experiencing life all of these people it took me half of the episode to realize who the main victim lady is cassie i was like God, i know this bitch mm-hmm. oh i looked but at I've... fucking everybody yeah it was crazy too because i loved bones i watched the shit out of bones and i was like where where's this lady from mm. i just don't remember anybody ever anyways Okay. Opening scene. Two people are kissing super hard and the camera is way too close to their faces and I <laughs> fucking hated it. Because they were like... Oh my god. <laughs> I legit gagged a tiny bit because the kissing noises and his face and hair and yeah. everything for some reason. The second it came on, I was like, my vagina sewed itself shut. You <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <Gross. laughs> yeah, uh, it was uh, too much. Like, back yeah. up, cameraman. Mm-hmm. Back up. Anyways, the my vagina looked him. like SpongeBob when it went out in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> when he goes out in the sun, <laughs> when his eyes like dry up, and him and Patrick are like, <laughs> but not it was not in a sexual way, just in like a it made me cringe way. Why would anybody think that <laughs> you comparing your vagina <laughs> to a dried up SpongeBob is sexual? No. <laughs> In any way. I guess anti-sexual, I guess. I don't mean it in an anti-sexual way. It, it has nothing to do with sexuality. It was just gross. It grossed me out. And that was my response to being grossed out by the like weird mouth noises. They cranked the ASMR like. Oh, they did. Yeah. Ugh. I've never been so grossed out by two people kissing on screen. I don't think I ever have. It was gross. Anyway, so she's like, hey, you want to. No, I want to talk about this for 10 more minutes. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Anyways, the woman invites him upstairs, but he has an early morning and needs to rest up because last night they boned super hard and he needs some rest. Ugh, and they had to like close talk about it. Oh, I know. Then he like kisses a chunk of her hair. <laughs> he, he's like, I gotta go, but I'll see you soon. And he lifts up like a fistful of her below shoulder length hair and kisses French it. French kissing it. No, I'm like, he kisses it <laughs> like he's kissing a hand, mademoiselle. It was fucking... <laughs> Yeah. so weird i was like what is this opening scene 
It was 15 seconds and it was the worst 15 seconds of my life. Oh, as soon as he kissed her hair, I'm like, he did it. Whatever's going to happen. I have no he idea what's happening, but he did it. Yeah. She goes into her building and walks into her apartment. Suddenly a masked person pushes into the apartment and attacks her. Mm-hmm. She gets knocked out and then they whip out a switchblade and cut off a chunk of her hair. So I'm like, oh, boyfriend. But I'm oh, like, wait, it's too early. For sure. I, don't know. I did too. Yeah. The dude popped the switchblade like he was going to have to dance knife fight with sharks and jets. <laughs> Yeah, it, had, it was a full screen. Let's get the knife shot. And it was a yeah. hand. And then you just saw. Yeah, it's like you're by yourself. You don't got a hot dog for anybody else unless you're <laughs> Tasha fucking singing Elvis. <laughs> if you had been by yourself with a switchblade, that's how you would have opened it. Oh, yeah. I would I would have done like, like finger flips <laughs> and stuff. Just slice the shit out of all my knuckles because I don't know how to do that. So uh, it cuts to Benson Stabler and the gang, and they're in her apartment. Her name is Cassie Germain. She's a cellist with the Manhattan Symphony. She's played by Emily Deschanel, Mm -hmm. Zoe Deschanel's big sister, also her own actor in her own right. I think she got into acting before her sister did. She did, but I don't know her from any. I've never really seen anything that she's in, but Mm -hmm. I saw it. I was like, why do you look so... First of all, she's freaking gorge and her eyes. I could just like live in there, but Mm -hmm. she She looked so... Yeah, Yeah, I didn't watch Bones, but she looked so familiar so i looked her up and i was like oh that's why yeah so she doesn't remember anything but she's pretty beat up her clothes were shredded and the purple wrote whore on her chest in blood i think it looks like lipstick but it could have been blood i'm assuming mm-hmm. it's blood yeah uh benson's going to ride with her to the hospital she's pretty shaken up obviously when she's sitting there and she's all wrapped up in her robe and the paramedic goes mind if i show him and just pops the blanket open just rips it open i was like holy shit forensics munch toots and stabler are rooting around the apartment they find a ton a tiny cameras all over the place and by a ton i mean four <laughs> um <laughs> even even in her room and her bathroom so we're like what the fuck is going on they also said that the range of technology that they found could reach up to a couple of blocks so they're looking at thousands of possible apartment or office locations in the hospital cassie is getting dressed after the rape kit they don't even know if she was raped nothing came up which isn't uncommon either mm-hmm. it all happened so fast and she couldn't give benson any details about the person and doesn't know who could have done this benson tells her about the camera and she rightfully freaks out as one would right she's like wait how long has this been going on and she's like we don't know they're trying to figure out if it's the same dude that attacked her cassie's boyfriend is waiting outside to take her home but she says it'll never be like home again i know i'm supposed to be thinking that it's this guy and then i'm supposed to realize that it's a diversion because we all know svu very well but i still think it's him even though i know better i know i'm not yeah (laughs) you're not gonna trick me svu and i'm like actually there was a couple times too because i Immediately, I was like, obviously, it's not the boyfriend. It's too early. And then later, I was like, maybe they were trying to throw us off like they do. Maybe it is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, at the performance backstage. Mm -hmm. I did. too. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we're in the hospital hallway now. Stabler is talking to her boyfriend and he asks him if he went straight home last night. The boyfriend. I don't even think we even know his name Um, the whole time. (laughs) We find it out later. I don't remember it. I didn't write it down. I hated him. Just because really? of the, the way we were introduced to him. The kissing thing. Yeah. Threw me right the fuck off the edge. Get out of here. He gets pissed and thinks that Stabler thinks it was him who attacked Cassie. He goes, I'm a victim too, because I was spied on too. First of all, I was like, okay. I mean, yeah, but. Yeah. He goes, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stabler's just kind of like, dude, I'm just doing my fucking job. This dude, even though I don't remember his name in the show, he's actor Robert Bogue, and he's from Brr- Oz. He tells Stabler that Cassie has complained about their conductor, Robert Prescott. Apparently, he's been hitting on her since she joined the symphony about six months ago. Cassie told him she wasn't interested, but he probably didn't listen because apparently Prescott has a hard time accepting no for an answer. The boyfriend is like, tell Stabler to go ask Valerie Baxter. She's a violinist Prescott was involved with. Apparently, he was abusive to her. And when she left, I said apparently like five times. I'm surprised you haven't been like, apparently. I'm trying not to. (laughs) I know. (laughs) <laughs> he was abusive to her and when she left he set up cassie in her old apartment and made her his little pet and then i was like oh my god the cameras prescott owns the place mm-hmm. okay then i'm like whoever this valerie chick is it's her because she's jealous or something <laughs> here we are let's get on the gabe thinks it's everybody roller coaster <laughs> and then i'm like i'm a genius when it's one of the five people i picked <laughs> In Cragen's office, the first thing we hear is him say, all that rage and he didn't rape her. It was such a weird opening line. I mean, I, I get it, but I was like, oh my God, the opening thing with the kissing, this weird line. Yeah. <laughs> 
But remember, Benson told Cassie that everything else about the attack pointed to a sexually motivated attack. Uh So, I mean, I can see why, but also, like, cool your fucking jets, Reagan. Yeah. The cops were there five minutes after the security company reported the alarm, so he may have not had a chance. This is what Benson calms Cragen down with. Yeah. And now, here we get the boyfriend's alibi. He was in a cab during the attack, so he's off the hook. And I'm like, "Mm, I'm not so sure, but okay for now. The Prescott guy, conductor guy, is looking good for it. He owns the building under Maestro LLC because he's... fuck you. Such a douchebag. (laughs) Yeah. So he owns this building, and... He had more than enough time to put cameras in when Valerie left and before Cassie moved in. And that's to say if they weren't already in there. Plus, he'd been chasing Cassie for a while. No matter who it was, the whole deal was meant to humiliate Cassie. Prescott conveniently left town to look at an investment property upstate, and he won't be back until the following night. And Craig mm-hmm. goes, well, where does a guy get this video hardware like he's never heard of a fucking Radio Shack? I know. Yeah. <laughs> Munch says the lab tracked the serial numbers of the cameras to a shop called Cork International. Benson found where Prescott's ex Valerie is. She's at the New York School of Music. Craig is like, go talk to her. Mm-hmm. So over at the New York School of Music, Benson and Stabler are talking to Valerie she is childlike in appearance she looks like a fucking 14 year old she's like the turtleneck everything it's fucking weird fitted turtleneck under a brown t-shirt with flowers on it that shit did not help that is something you wear to art club in sixth grade and it has nothing to do with anything no it doesn't um it's weird she was 23 when this was filmed. This actor is Lena Jorgis. She was in the Dirty John series. And so I was like looking into her a little bit. So this is 2002. She's 23. She is aging like a fine, gorgeous Jorgis wine. Jorgis. She said that Prescott told her she was very gifted but needed to learn discipline. He took her under his wing and they would work late nights together. He was very demanding, but it worked for her because she felt like she was feeling the music on a deeper level. We can all see where this is going about a month right. after the private session started it became sexual and it made her feel special it didn't get abusive until she told him she wanted out she tells the detectives that one night after he'd fallen asleep she went to grab an extra blanket out of the closet and found a video camera that was aimed through a hole in the wall and the red light was flashing then she saw a row of vhs tapes on a shelf with women's names on them and she ended it and he berated and threatened her mm-hmm. and as soon as i hear the story i'm like it's him but it's definitely not him for sure right don't make me go down this path i'm not going there with you dick wolf cut to cork international munch and toots are talking to the owner or whoever this isn't going to register for you but i just i had a lot of these this episode this dude is a dead ringer for brian moylan okay he's an author who writes real housewives shit like their memoirs and shit Hmm. keep going somebody will know and go oh yeah (laughs) <laughs> he's explaining a ton of the equipment and how small it is and blah 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 and apparently after 9-11 it's been selling like crazy although he didn't show them where you can find the <laughs> what's the bandana head cam that fits in your <laughs> cargo pants <laughs> yeah that full bible sized recorder <laughs> This dude's looking at the camera equipment that they found in Cassie's apartment, and it's expensive. Turns out it was ordered online and charged to a credit card with the name Herman Garfunkel. Like, that's a real name. Um, (laughs) When the equipment showed up to the address, Garfunkel's wife told him he had been dead for three years. It was delivered to a P.O. box that was also paid for by Mr. Dead Garfunkel. Jesus. (laughs) Mr. Dead Garfunkel. (laughs) Mr. Garfunkel. All very close to Cassie and Prescott's apartments. Craigan's like, we don't have enough for a warrant. Um, I said that with a W. <laughs> well, when did you? Yeah. Kragen says they don't have enough for a warrant to get into the Prescott penthouse. Prescott penthouse. And it's not illegal for him to record stuff in his own house, even without the guest's consent. And he owns Cassie's apartment, so he may not be on the hook for that either, mm-hmm. which is bananas to me. Now there's a ton of laws and stuff. Right. Right? Yeah. There has to be. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you're going to talk about it. Uh, I can't wait. I was, there's some okay. laws that came up. Yeah. I mean, it costs 
women their lives because fucking mm -hmm. sh we can't keep up with shit yeah so uh everybody does that thing where they get mad at cabot for telling them the law and how it works oh my god and like kind of start mildly attacking her benson's like what if they found cameras in your bathroom for the millionth time she's not defending this dude she's telling you she knows the law yeah. and they need to find other stuff so she can make a fucking case and help them you know what yeah, i mean yeah it's their job to get the evidence it's her job to kick ass in court so stop giving her shit no shit oh she's not like you guys i don't like this yeah i don't want to do this you guys i have a bad feeling about this emotionally right i think we're prioritizing the wrong thing here i think we need to regroup I'm probably getting my period i don't know she finds a damn way to get a warrant for the video receiver and recording equipment but that's it mm -hmm. that's all she can fucking do right now we're at the prescott apartment everyone's looking around <laughs> nobody can find <laughs> you know nobody can Nobody can find anything, and Benson finds this huge armoire thing, or whatever it's called, yeah. like a wardrobe with a bunch of VH tap. It wasn't even locked or anything. She just popped you know? it on open. Everybody's like, Where? we've been here for so long. She's like, let's check that big thing <laughs> with the doors. And the glory <laughs> hole sized hole on the side of it with a yeah. camera peeking through. Did you see that? Like, So she opened it and it was full of VHS tapes and a camera on a yeah. tripod. But it was like a regular handheld early aughts camera. Like a golf ball could have fit through the hole that it needed to be able to film. Yeah. If I was banging some dude, I'd be like... <laughs> What is that? What's that? It's that shiny thing coming out of the huge closet. What is that? I'm going to check because it's not locked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's where he apparently keeps his blankets, too, for guests. <laughs> they bag up the tapes to watch overnight before Prescott gets back in the morning. Mm -hmm. Back at the precinct, Benson and Stabler are on tape number 10. Looks like Prescott is boring in the sack, <laughs> is what Benson kind of said. Munch and Toots and Craig and pop in with another tape, and Toots goes, wait till you see this. And Benny replies, what you got? More romping around? Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I just, I skipped over it because I was like, no. You don't get to skip over that. <laughs> that will be addressed. But, but in this video, it shows a tape of Cassie and Prescott kissing. Ew. I thought she said that she didn't want to. Anyways, it was time stamped last month. Why didn't she tell Benson any of this? Mm -hmm. Craig wants to get both Cassie and Prescott in different rooms to figure out what the hell is going on. Now we're in a conference room. Benson demands Cassie tell the truth. Stabler is like, oh, we found the tape of you and Prescott. She's like, I didn't tell you guys because Prescott threatened to ruin my career. Mm -hmm. Cassie says she met Prescott like eight months ago at a competition she won. He offered to bring her to New York. He placed her with the best instructors, introduced her to all the right people. People. He was always there for her and she fell in love. It went to shit when she stopped by his apartment to give him a birthday gift and he was in bed with another woman. Mm -hmm. She broke it off and said she was quitting the orchestra and he told her that he had invested too much in her. Then he showed her the tape of them together and threatened to show it to his like business buddies and stuff and like ruin her. Which is insane that that would ruin I her. I know. If I was a business associate and this guy was like, oh yeah, don't work with her. Look at the secret tape I took of us fucking. Isn't she gross? What? Yeah, that's so fucked up. So she threatened to press charges and he said it was his word against hers which is also insane. All this happened like a little over a month ago. She says he hasn't been threatening to her per se, but she's been getting these weird phone calls and flowers after every show. The cards always say, all my love, me. Mm -hmm. All my love, comma, me. The second she walks into her apartment, her phone starts ringing. She will answer and he always hangs up. She thought it was Prescott trying to intimidate her. She realizes the cameras are telling the perp when she gets home and that's when he knows to start calling. She's shocked. She always gets flowers from the same place it's called Farrelly's. Farrelly's flowers <laughs> Farrelly's flowers <laughs> toots knocks on the door saying prescott and his lawyer are here and i knew they were gonna do a fucking overlap oh they were gonna cross paths in the precinct yeah stabler asked munch and toots to give cassie a ride back to rehearsal and benson and stabler will interrogate prescott now in the interrogation room, Benson and Stabler are with Prescott and his lawyer. Okay, up until this point, we have fully dropped the ball in introducing the future Mr. Marishka Hargitay, attorney Trevor Langan, IRL Peter Herman. Moving forward, we will watch him try not to show how in love he is falling with Benson because it's not his SVU storyline. Who, wh where is he? He's the lawyer. What? That's Marishka's husband. The lawyer for Prescott? Mm-hmm. I must have thought it was a different guy. Seeing him back in action makes me just super pumped watching him watch 
spends it. Like every time he shoots eyes to her, I'm like, I wonder if he got little butterflies and had to be like, stop it. Remember your lines. Yeah, this is cute. So (laughs) this dude and his lawyer are arguing that videotaping the women was consensual. Prescott says that Valerie's fragile and lying about not knowing that he was taping her. They then ask about Cassie. They ask him if he has cameras in all of his apartments that he sublets and rents to new hires and employees. Or does he send them all love notes and flowers too? And he denies it. They ask where he was the night Cassie was attacked. He just gets pissed that they're insinuating that he had something to do with her attack. This guy's really, um, he's very, he looks like he would have an umbrella corporation called Maestro, Maestro LLC. LLC. Yeah, yeah, gross. Like he's wearing like transition glasses and Munch is like, hey, that's my thing. <laughs> He's just like, oh my God, why would I have anything to do with her attack? I'm going to make her a star. I wouldn't fucking hurt her. She's going to make me a lot of money. But Benson says that he still hasn't answered the question. Where was he? Mm -hmm. And he says he was with another young woman. This was so fucking creepy the way he had to fucking do this. He's like, Mm -hmm. you've got my tapes. She's the last one recorded, timestamped, dated. He had to like give them a little puzzle to get the woman's name instead of being like Jen. Yeah. Yeah, right. Just you. Craig knocks on the door and calls Stabler out. He tells him that Munch and Toots called from the concert hall. There's been another attack. Uh, The guy they have in custody. It's not this guy. It can't be him now. (laughs) It's somebody else. Get to the concert hall, guys. (laughs) They do this a lot. Where it's like the person's in custody and then another crime happens. Cut to the concert hall. Munch tells Benson and Stabler that the musicians came back from a break and there was a note written in blood in between the street rings on Cassie's cello and it says die bitch yeah and I was like whoa back to the squad room Stabler tells Craig and Wong Benson is staying with Cassie until her friend gets to her house Stabler had checked out the flower place and said the clerk remembered the guy and that he always paid with cash and had scraggly blonde hair and whatever Mm -hmm. he set him up with a sketch artist Toots thinks Prescott maybe hired somebody and then I'm like oh my god that Valerie girl did it whatever (laughs) Wong disagrees. The attacks are way too personal. This guy could be an erotomaniac. Like, he thinks he's in a relationship with Cassie that doesn't exist. Fucking Munch is like, sounds like me and my four ex-wives. <laughs> sure, Jan. Yeah. I was, Fuck even off. I was like, shut up, Munch. Yeah. But the best is that Huang silently looks at Munch and then turns away to keep talking instead of acknowledging it at all. Like, the subtle shade of like, yeah, I heard you. Mm-mm. Yeah. So Cassie might not even know this dude. Yeah. Toots asks Huang what could have set him off to take this kind of action and Huang says a look smile a casual hello but to him it's the beginning of a beautiful love affair and they're all kind of casually talking as if Huang isn't coming up with the best possible ideas of how this came to be you know what I'm saying like they need to lean in a little harder when he speaks yeah Stabler brings up that first season episode where we first meet the hot bomb squad guy Mm -hmm. and he was like the guy thought the newscaster was sending him secret signals this one was where munch was super close to the lady yeah you remember that right yeah yeah except Stabler says he followed her home one night and shot her but in that episode he blew up her apartment so i don't know what that was about did he shoot her and then blow up the apartment to cover the crime no she opened up he gave her flowers and she opened up the box and it blew out her entire apartment oh They all speculate that seeing her be intimate with another dude could have flipped his switch from love me to die, bitch. They're all like, hmm, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe this, maybe that. And Toots is like, so where do we find this straggly haired freak? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he's over it. Let's get out in the field, everybody. Craig is going to double the door to door sweep team because it's taking a long time getting all the warrants for the apartments that are in the receiver zone, which is like thousands. Mm-hmm. Craig wants them to focus on anyone who's been in or around Cassie's apartment between the equipment purchase date, which is the third of last month and today. Right. He had to be around to plant the cameras. In Cassie's building, this guy, building manager, whoever, is telling Stabler that the building got a security overhaul and every tenant had to allow someone to come in. This fucking guy is IRL LeFou, guest on Sidekick in Beauty and the Beast. He is. Oh my God, totally. I made something. I sent it to you just now. Oh my God, I can't wait for it to get here. Do you send it in? I texted it to you. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> Fucking 100%. Thank you. I was fucking on it today. I don't know what this was about. (laughs) 
So for maintenance, they give prior notice to the tenants. And if they can't be there, this guy, LeFou, stays in the apartment until the work is done. It's policy. Yes. It's fucking policy, he says. Last month, a plumber was there and there was a security tech that came up to her apartment to check on the new alarm system. So the guy was in there for about an hour and they were like, well, was it or was it not? Like, what was it? And he's like, well, I wasn't in Cassie's apartment while it was being done. Like, I'm supposed to be. There was another issue in a different tenant's apartment. And- Sailor was like so much for policy okay because he really he himself focused on the policy part he's like it's policy right and then was like just kidding it was like why even bring that up except this specific thing we're talking about i did not follow (laughs) policy no yeah he goes on to give stabler the name of the tech ray campbell Mm -hmm. at the tech company stabler's doing a walk and talk with the security business owner the dude is breathing super hard the whole time (laughs) yeah he is he just ran around the block four times and then was like oh my god okay hey (laughs) <laughs> yeah, he's one of my best guys. <laughs> he's been with me for 10 years. <laughs> yeah, I can give you all his work orders and stuff. Hold on, let me pull him up real quick. He sounds like me going up three stairs. <laughs> <laughs> he tells Stabler that since 9-11, he's had to hire a ton of people, some good tech, some not so good. But Ray's been with him for 10 years and he's one of his best men. This dude checks the paperwork that he's got on hand and says it's weird because Ray never logged the work order into the system for his security checkup in Cassie's apartment. Ray was at another location that day nearby or he was assigned to be. Mm-hmm. So he tells Stabler where Ray is right now yep we see stabler walking up to this work van and shows his badge to the lead singer of fallout boy aka ray <laughs> he has the worst scraggly wig on i it's the wig is the nuts. wig the wig <laughs> first of all this man is not a blonde <laughs> And this man right. does not have this kind of... It was a wig under a hat. The hat was like an inch tall. It was just like <laughs> resting was, atop this mountain yeah. of... Wig. Spider plant wig. <laughs> <laughs> So Stabes immediately starts questioning him and Ray tells Stabes that, yeah, he worked the job at Cassie's apartment, but he installed the system a few months ago and he had never been back. Mm-hmm. Stabes is like, well, is this your employee number? And he's like, yeah, it, this guy is such a fucking sass too. As soon as yeah. he knows that Stabler has not a leg to stand on and he's given him attitude, he's like, oh yeah, I'm going to fucking give it my back. So he's like, yeah, that's my employee number, but it's not my signature. And Stabler's mm-hmm. like, whose signature is it? And he's like, I don't know. Maybe it's the same guy that stole the rest of my stuff. Hmm. Yeah. And he's like, I gotta go brush my hair. <laughs> he says it about a month Just ago. Just kidding, so- I don't. <laughs> says about a month ago someone broke into his truck and even took his fucking paperwork who does that who does that and he's like leave me alone and he flips his little weird mullet scraggle joe dirt party city fucking wig (laughs) go back to party city where you belong Cut to Craigan's office. Stabler is telling Benson and Craigan that the perp poses as a security tech dude to get into the building. Cassie's apartment is within the receiving range for the cameras, so the receiver has to be one of the other two buildings. Bunch of tech talk. I don't fucking know. One of the dudes in the second building doing a work order put an unauthorized DSL line in blah, 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 blah. Yeah, basically the building's all set up to send out a video signal. I like that. How he was like, they put a work order for a DSL line and Benson was like, hey, you could send video on that. It's like... <laughs> Shut up. None of you guys know what's going on. <laughs> Craigan wants Munch and Toots to head to that second building now. <laughs> We're in the second building. Toots is complaining again about how him and Munch always get shitty assignments. Fucking forensic techs folks are swarming everywhere. They find the DSL line connected to the telephone junction line. And Munch says, looks like what hooks my computer up to the World Wide Web. <laughs> <sighs> I'm skipping that emotionally. I'm just skipping it. Um, (laughs) Behind behind a loose box is a receiver connected to a laptop, which is connected to the four cameras. Mm -hmm. Basically, the perp is sending the videos out onto the internet. Yeah. Was it Munch who said this? He goes, you mean he's sending the video out? over the internet like it's such a hilariously dated question because that's the only way we send video (laughs) yeah you're saying he's taking the vhs tapes from the camera and mailing them to the internet where the (laughs) internet pushes them puts them into a vcr squad room so this so the perp is hosting his own website Mm -hmm. the only computer making a ton of hits to the website belongs to a dude named terry willard at terry willard's apartment benson stabler munch toots and the super slash building manager are in the hall she's this soft-spoken walking cardigan and (laughs) stabes pounds on the door and yells terry willard new york city detectives 
open up. Cardigan standing outside with four SVU detectives, one of them banging and yelling, goes, he's not in any trouble, is he? <laughs> I know. Like, what do you think? They hand her a warrant to open the door and she's like, oh no. And Terry's not there. She says he's probably still at work. There's a door in his apartment with a padlock on the outside that this woman does not have a key for. And Toots breaks into it like it's made of fucking cardboard. I know. (laughs) He just looked at it and he was like, (sighs) and it exploded. (laughs) This is a whole ass room that is a full on shrine to Cassie. Photos everywhere. He's got her college yearbook from 1997. The lighting on Stabler when he's standing behind this cardboard cutout of Cassie is (laughs) haunting. I took a photo. I'm going to post it. I didn't even see it. Oh, it was scary. I was just looking at the thing. Oh, here. I'm going to send it to you then. I'm going to send it to you right now. Ew. Yeah. Yeah, I did not notice that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Munch is bringing the computer to the lab to see what they can get off of it. This super cardigan tells Benson and Stabler that Willard is a really good dude. He's sweet and gentle. Uh Uh-oh, he's also her boyfriend. And I was like, oh my God, it's her, right? Oh, like, yeah. Er- yeah. Every single person was. Uh. <laughs> she tells them, I've never been in that room and he's never mentioned Cassie to me. She's way too fucking chill about finding a packed shrine room of a stalked woman in her boyfriend's apartment. Yeah. I either feel very sorry for her. Or I'm very suspicious of her. Yeah. She says that Terry doesn't have too many friends because he's so busy being a partner at an Internet company called Web Trends in Soho. Oh, honey. <laughs> Web trends with a Z. Cut to web trends. <laughs> Joe Rogan's little brother tells Stabler and Benson that they laid Terry off a couple of months ago. He's not a partner, but he's a great website. I got no reaction for Joe Rogan's little brother. Oh, uh, say it again. I was looking at the dog I saw at the corner of my eye. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> There was like vanilla. Let's talk about how we were both just bonding over getting um, diagnosed with ADHD. (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't (laughs) hear you. I was looking at a dog out of the corner of my eye. I just saw her little tail in the window and I was like, um, I said, you Joe Rogan's little brother. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. That was my cue, right? Sorry. It was. And Joe Rogan's little brother is, uh, he works at web trends with the Z. Yeah. You know what? I feel so confident about that joke that I didn't even need the laugh. I didn't. I felt good about it for me. You shouldn't. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You shouldn't feel confident. You should feel like a real idiot. Just kidding. (laughs) I I was like, I thought you meant I shouldn't, I shouldn't need your laugh to feel good about myself, but you meant I feel like I shouldn't feel feel confident. (laughs) You shouldn't feel confident, yeah. Um, that's what I meant. I feel like this is like the joke I had about the breathing on the window thing. What? And no, nobody laughed about it, remember? No. I called was, you, I, like, I gotta tell you this joke. It must have been remember? so bad, I don't even remember it. Okay, so my friend Sam, we were having a beer, and he was like, I'm gonna do a shot of, uh, what is that shit from Fireball. Chicago? No, that's what I had. Shit um, from Chicago. Oh, yeah. Malort. Mm-hmm. You know? And it's it's so disgusting. Even the bartender was giving him shit. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I, I love it because it lets me know that I'm alive. And I said, can't you just breathe on a window or something? And he didn't hear it. <laughs> yeah, um, that's right. He didn't hear it. So I said it again. And he was like, oh, that was funny. And I was like, I know. That's why I said it twice. And um, it's not, I don't think. Yeah, I didn't. Um... Like maybe in a movie or something, if some snarky friend was like, can't you just breathe on a window? Yeah. <laughs> Or not. I don't know. I, thought I don't know. Good. Maybe it. Maybe you had to be there. Maybe it was one of those. Mm. But anyway, we're not going to acknowledge that this guy looks exactly like he's a little brother to Joe Rogan. OK, he's telling the detectives that Terry's not a partner, but he's a great website designer. They had to let him go because they had to dump 90 percent of their people when the stock market took a shit. He guides them over through all the empty cubicles, saying that they were full a few months ago. And Terry was pissed when they had to let him go. This guy's like, Terry was so quiet, you'd forget he was there. But I noticed a bunch of stuff that I'm going to tell you right now in the last few weeks of him working. His work habits became erratic and we had no choice but to let him go. He would miss work for days at a time. He'd come in dreary eyed and tired. And then when we let him go, he kind of snapped and they were like, whoa. And I was like, who's Terry? Besides my mom. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Over at the lab. A tech lab dude is shown Munch and Toots footage of Cassie's cameras in her apartment. So the perp downloads the videos, edits them, transfers it to a DVD. He even puts music to the videos. There's yeah. no sound or anything, which is fucked. Dude fast forwards to the night of the attack and you can see shadows and struggling. Mm-hmm. The perp shut the door so there was no light and he can't see anything. He hands them a pile of papers and says they might like this. So we're like, what is it? While Craigan's reading it in the squad room, the title, he just goes, The Legend of Cassie and Terry. (laughs) This thing that he's reading, this fucking made up fantasy story. It's an online love journal that Terry started four years ago at Indiana University. Munch says, oh, he must have heard her play the cello and was like, you know, created this little fantasy, right? Yeah. And then Toot says, must have struck a chord nobody Craigan doesn't look back that's it and then you could see him kind of lean forward like he wanted to be like do you hear my joke you guys oh my god toots was the me of five minutes ago (laughs) (laughs) and the me all the time where i'm like they didn't hear it i gotta say it again (laughs) you guys hear that joke but he's secure enough that he's like we can just keep going this is yeah this this other thing that we're talking about is important there's no way he's no there's no way if you tell a good joke you don't think anybody hear it you wrestle for a while (laughs) If you should repeat it. You know you do. I do. You know, just let that shit go. You try to work it in some point later. You're like, I'm going to save Keep that for secret. another group of friends who appreciates me. Keep it secret. Keep it safe. <laughs> Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yeah. Munch continues and says, Terry... <laughs> Munch continues and says Terry followed Cassie to her competitions all across the world. But Terry went to prison for credit card fraud. He used fraud to pay for their trips. Mm -hmm. By the time he got out of jail, Cassie had moved. So he found her address. There's nothing in the journal that mentions that this guy was the doer. So gross. I know. Stop saying that. I hate that term. And there are no leads to his whereabouts. The super lady cardigan girlfriend hasn't heard from him in a couple of days but they're sure he knows they're on to him munch knows mm-hmm. terry's in town because he has a bunch of online names that he's used public computers to visit his sites the lab mm-hmm. dude is keeping the sites and credit cards active to track terry's movements but he has to stay online long enough for servers to be able to track him and if he doesn't mm-hmm. he's under their radar Craigan mm-hmm. wants to try and flush him out by bringing cassie in to talk to benson and stabler he's got a plan i fucking hate it i know now we're in Craigan's office. Benson, Stabler, Craig, and Cassie and Huang are there. They show Terry's four-year-old mugshot to Cassie. They tell her he's been following her since college. She's like, I have never seen him before. Mm, terrifying. I know, but Huang tells her that Terry thinks that they know each other. and He concocted a whole love affair, but he used the cameras and stuff to observe her without having to feel rejection. He's not one of those stalkers that is like, I'm here. Right. He just is just watching and coming up with this fantasy life. They tell her about the four-year journal. Terry believes that the two of them are in love. She wants the stopped she's like this is fucked mm-hmm. uh, can you even imagine that oh oh my god i'd be like wait is he hot no i'm just kidding. oh my god <laughs> i know i'm kidding i'm kidding craigan says <laughs> i'm like i'm kidding i'm kidding did you think i was serious i'm kidding i'm kidding please <laughs> craigan says that they can use her help and i'm like oh great terry goes to the website he made for her three times a day craigan wants her to give a message to him in her press interviews like dedicate a performance to him mm-hmm. and she's like way not into it obviously. big time yeah and stabler says they'll cover everything and not let this dude close to her but we all know that won't happen right we know that right she doesn't trust them to catch him mm-hmm. they want to get him into a controlled situation on their terms but won't do it unless she says yes so i hate this for so many fucking reasons first right. of all there are basically no laws that really protect her long term even if he Mm -hmm. was arrested the charges that they have on him can't hold him for very long and what does a stalker do they're gonna come back right yeah they don't yeah it's not until somebody commits a felony crime that it actually does anything to affect this person and or they hurt the person well that's what i'm saying yeah you know yeah Yeah. So they're like, hey, send him an intentional message inviting this kind Mm -hmm. of response. Somebody who's that unwell will cling to that far beyond their case. You know what I'm saying? I'm so mad at Craigan for this storyline. Yeah. All right. Now we're at the concert hall. The gang's all there, dressed to the nines. 
surveilling the joint with the stupid ass earpieces that look like someone is wearing an earpiece <laughs> yeah <laughs> and toots and staves are in their tuxes with their little bow ties oh and it's so fucking so cute. cute the lab is there in a different room it has a camera hooked up to each entrance with a facial recognition in the software uh-huh. the face recognition technology is like way young so they had to like make adjustments for hair glasses facial hair etc which is so funny because now it's like now tom cruise is like i need to get somebody else's eyes <laughs> yeah i <laughs> I put a filter on me that was so good that I was convinced it was me. Ooh. You know what I mean? I was like, I'm the prettiest person in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and it like moved with my face. It's so fucking weird. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We all know that shit. But Munch says some shit about Big Brother, the 1984 reference. If yeah. didn't know. They have a facial recognition hit. A dude with a beard behind a woman in a red dress. Stabler wants to take this guy to the side. They're getting a few hits, actually. Benson is behind the curtain with Cassie, who is super nervous to go on stage. Of course! Yeah. Benson calms her down and says they're checking everyone. Everything's fine. Her boyfriend's going to be in the front row. Like her boyfriend's backstage and he's like, hey, I'm going to go sit. I'll be right there in the front row. And he kisses the side of her head. I forgot about him, but now he is back on my radar. And I'm like, (laughs) you're orchestrating this. (laughs) Ooh. Orchestrating at an orchestra. (laughs) Toots and I just high fived. She goes on stage and starts to play. Behind the curtain, none of the hits have panned out, but a tech guy found a box for Cassie and they just open it. Yeah. After after 9-11, after all the shit, they, they just open it. No shit. Not worried about a bomb or anything. Mm-hmm. Anyways, I, that was, I was like, this is fucking whatever. These are bad They cops. literally <laughs> referenced an episode where a flower box was open and a bomb yeah. went off. <laughs> And they talked about 9-11 like four times in this episode. Mm-hmm. I wonder if they changed it to being shot instead of the bomb thing because of 9-11. I don't know. So it's some roses with a dead rat on there. And the dead rat looks really real. And it reminded mm. me of that mouse in the basement. And I almost started crying. Oh, my God. All right. They got another hit. They go up to the guy and he starts making a scene. He's like, she invited me. No, I'm supposed to be here. And we're like, oh, this is the guy. And she stops playing and she's like watching them take him out. It was very unsettling. In the interrogation room. OMG. It's Ryan fucking McPoyle. That's who he is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. And it's so crazy. I was kicking myself a couple episodes ago for not telling you that I thought that Otis Tool looked like a McPoyle. Mm -hmm. One of the, you know, seven clean generations of McPoyles. (laughs) So then when this guy popped up, I'm like, oh, man, this motherfucker looks like a McPoyle, too. And I Googled him and I'm like, it's Ryan. It is a McPoyle. Do you know I watched uh, the 15 seasons of Always Sunny in like a week and a half? I know you did. Are there going to be any more or no? Is it done? I fucking hope so. But if you have not caught up with Always Sunny, oh my God, the final episode of season 15. Don't tell me. I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to tell you the emotional response. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to tell. I'm not going to tell you anything that happens, but the emotional response that they are able to get. Oh, my God. I sobbed. I sobbed. Don't watch. I need to get caught up. You need to get caught up. God, it is. It's fucking iconic. Okay, this guy, McPoyle, is gushing about Cassie and how great she is. It's actually very sad. And he's doing a really great job acting wise. Mm -hmm. He tells Stabler and Cragen that they met because he was taking a shortcut and he heard her playing her cello and she smiled at him. He said he knew they'd be together for the rest of their lives after that. Cragen tries to get them all riled up and says that Cassie knew he was watching and she was laughing at him when she was sleeping with other men and stabler said if i had made all those sacrifices i'd want to slap her too terry says no i would never hurt cassie it was horrible the way he beat her uh excuse me Mm -hmm. craigan leans in and asks how did you know she was beaten he said that he saw it on her website on the internet but they're like oh so you just came across her website this girl that you've been stalking for years okay they're trying to get him to admit that he set up the credit card scams to get the cameras to plant in her house Mm -hmm. then they ask him about the cello and the rat and the scary notes and shit this is when he genuinely seems like he doesn't know what they're talking about he says that amy cardigan landlady girlfriend told him that they were trying to put him in jail for something that he didn't do and that's why he's running and then he also denies that amy is his girlfriend he's like Mm -hmm. she's not my girlfriend she's my landlady whatever she told you she's lying sailor's mad and he yells for him to stop lying they can't help him if he won't help himself craigan wants the truth and maybe they can convince the da to go easy on him but terry's sticking to his story staves has had enough let me tell you something terry i think you're lying you're playing her because he can't pay the rent and you're playing us because you think we're stupid yeah i think he's a creep but i don't think he did this particular thing yeah i mean the attacking stuff 
The camera stuff for sure. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, he's a fucking piece of shit. That's where I go back to Cassie's fucking boyfriend. What is this guy mm-hmm. doing? How is he involved? All right, now we're in the squad room. Cabot's there. She's telling Benson and Stabler and Cragen they have no evidence. They don't even have proof Terry used the cards to make the purchases. His fingerprints were in Cassie's apartment. All that they have on that is maybe trespassing. Even stalking won't stick because that requires proof he tried to scare her. All they have is that Terry tried to remain hidden. Cassie hadn't even seen him until tonight, okay? Mm-hmm. I'm so fucked up. It is super fucked up because what does his intention of scaring her have to do with her being scared? You know what I mean? Somebody Our following stops. me and surveilling yeah. me is going to scare me whether that was your intention or not. Right. I think a lot of things have changed since then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because they found the tech company's uniform in Terry's apartment. She can up the charge to burglary of the van. And she says until the law catches up with technology, she doesn't really have anything to work with. Which is like... It seems, you know, the people in charge, you're supposed to be the brightest, right? I hear her say that and I go, why don't they do these things in tandem? You know, some new technology comes out and you like have somebody that works in analytics that goes over the laws and stuff to... to well, introduce it to hard. society along with what do you mean i think that with how fast technology is and all the fucked up yeah. things people can find to do that's true you don't know if something is bad until it happens and mm-hmm. you're like this has got to ch-. and that sucks like cyberbullying and like shit like that right you know <sighs> it sucks that that's how that shit is but i mean yeah i mean it's cool we'll all be dead soon 100 years all new people right so <laughs> does that bring you comfort does that feel good <sighs> i have to get a cpap <laughs> Toots is glad they all at least pulled the plug on the camera shit and all the other stuff Terry was doing. Yeah, Munch goes, I heard that once a video's on the internet, it can't be destroyed. You'd be surprised at what some scrubbing can get rid of. Right. Benson walks in. Amy posted Terry's bail. And I was like, oh my God, is this Amy? (gasps) Amy is the super landlord, not girlfriend, girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Stabler wants to get a detail on Cassie because he doesn't trust Terry at all. It's too late. Cassie's been shot. Oh my fucking God. They literally can never keep anybody safe. No. Whenever they say we're going to protect you just know that that means that they're gonna get you murdered and oh my god cassie was like i don't want to participate in this i'm gonna get hurt and they're like nope mm -mm. we're gonna make sure that you're good we're pretty sure we know what we're doing and she's like okay fine but if i get shot (laughs) it's on you and they're like you won't she's like i think i'm gonna i think i'm gonna All right, now we're at the hospital. Benson and Stabler rush into the waiting room where Cassie's boyfriend says she's in surgery still. Mm -hmm. He said that he's like all flustered and stuff. He said that Cassie came to pick him up and he ran upstairs to get his wallet. He forgot. And then he heard the shots. Is it just that I hate him? Mm -hmm. that i I can't shake being suspicious of him he's like no i was well i went inside and i'm like oh you know what you know who goes inside and doesn't see the crime happen and is gone just for the moment of the crime happening i mean the whole time i'm like it was him it was fucking him Mm -hmm. especially now poor bereaved well he's not bereaved she's alive but poor upset boyfriend who has yep. been nothing but good this whole time i know like he's Very been nothing sp- but good and i'm like well, you stop are stop sniffing hair stop <laughs> sniffing hair and maybe p- fucking people will trust you you, you know you made those weird asmr kiss mouth noises and then you sniffed her hair and i haven't trusted you since and i was like you know what i hope this motherfucker goes to prison for something <laughs> anything he can't be in gen pop because he's a hair sniffer <laughs> <laughs> he's just jaywalking and fucking toots like does the <laughs> jump down like, dives up the away. side of a building yeah <laughs> i was bringing coffee and donuts to my girlfriend's house she didn't want to get dressed to leave i was doing he's just a nice guy doing nice things the law's the law there's a lot of nice guys we're gonna throw the book at you a lot of people's oh. girlfriends are in there i don't know <laughs> <laughs> Cassie's surgeon comes out and says that Cassie is doing okay and she was very lucky. This is the same surgeon, I think, that... Yeah, she looks really familiar. She's the one from the episode where that little boy got killed, mm-hmm. murdered by somebody, and she was just, like... Doing all the x-ray stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Benson and Stabler pull her aside. Stabler steps off to take a phone call, which we all know is going to be fucking awful. The surgeon says Cassie took two slugs to the back and one hit the left kidney and the other barely missed her heart. Whew. She thinks it was a twenty two at close range, and they can talk to Cassie after she's out of recovery. Stabler was on the phone with Munch, who says they got another hit on Cassie's website two blocks from the hospital at an internet cafe. And I know fucking New York City is huge, but everything is always two blocks away. <laughs> every every yeah. perp is always two blocks away. We got to get over there. It'll take us five minutes from anywhere. <laughs> Two blocks. Two blocks. Let's go get dinner at the fanciest restaurant in the state of New York. Two blocks. <laughs> oh my God, we've got to go down to the pier. Somebody was just murdered. How far away is it? Two blocks. You know what? I want to adopt a dog. 
Two blocks. <laughs> hey, let's head over to Times Square at Macy's Parade. Oh, cool. It's two blocks away. I'm going to buy a new house. Brownstone. Two blocks. Hurry. I got to get to JFK. My flight's leaving. Two blocks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh my god <laughs> <laughs> oh my god the son you never knew you had has lived in the city this entire time how far away two blocks <laughs> Can you your, your whole life <laughs> <laughs> sorry i got you i know you saw me like thinking and then <laughs> okay benson's gonna stay with cassie what's, that one, takes magician? Off to go to the what's that one magician's name david blaine no <laughs> what's the, with an s oh no <laughs> Not with an S. David Copperfield is going to make the Statue of Liberty disappear. <laughs> Let's get over there. But he's going to do it in five minutes. <laughs> Two blocks. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Benson's going to stay with Ca- I mean, Benson's going to stay with Cassie. All right. Yeah. Stabler takes off to go to the cafe and the music is getting all swelly. This is what I'm talking about when I say that I was looking into everybody. We're now at Joe's Internet Cafe. Munch and Stabes. Darkwing Duck. Walk into the cafe because this person is still online. Toots Mm -hmm. is in there too. Oh shit. Stabler sees a little kid watching the website. So this kid is the actor Nicholas Braun. He's been in a ton of shit since this. But the biggest Mm -hmm. one is probably playing Greg Hirsch in Succession on HBO. I've heard a million Mm -hmm. good things about this fucking show. Everybody says it's the best show on TV. I can't believe I've never watched it. It's next on my list. I'm going to watch it. You know what? Hmm. Um, Have you seen Suits? Fuck you! Mm. okay um anyway so this kid it's just funny because i don't normally look up the kids unless they look somewhat uh, he was a good little actor though because he was like whoa whoa just, yeah and he's had yeah. a million roles but so the detectives come up on him he's a little kid at this time they ask him what he's doing and he panics he says that this dude was sitting there and left the computer on after the guy left he sat down to check it out because he doesn't have a fucking phone with a screen on it he's like look at that open computer what's that a lady changing her clothes on the screen cassie yeah sitting on her bed getting changed or leggings and shit yeah yeah and they're like what the dude look like he's like it was a scraggly wigged out guy blubbering about some chick who left him for another guy so they showed him a pic of terry the kid's like yep that's him he took off about 10 minutes ago the clerk said that the guy left a credit card mm, but the card had amy's name on it oh shit landlord not girlfriend cardigan girlfriend mm-hmm. stabler sends munch and toots to find her staves is gonna run back to the hospital to see if benson got anywhere with cassie we're outside of Amy's apartment. She's in a hurry. She's making dinner for a pal in Brooklyn. Bullshit. Yeah. She tells Munch and Toots that sh- Terry hasn't been home since he got out of jail. Mm-hmm. They show her that Terry used her card to watch the website of Cassie at the internet cafe or whatever. Amy's like, oh, that's a mistake. They tell her someone shot Cassie and she says it couldn't have been Terry. You don't understand him. He's the most gentle man I know. He's just the sweetest thing. The best is that she goes, you got him all wrong, detective. Munch's yeah. hat is throwing this woman off of what era of crime show <laughs> she's on. Because she talks very like they should be in black and white. Yeah. You're just a gumshoe. You don't understand. (laughs) They don't believe anything she's fucking saying. So they decide Uh to tail her. Like she's not going to make dinner. At the hospital, Cassie tells benson and stabler that she was waiting in the garage for kevin her boyfriend that's the only time his name is mentioned and it's the name i hate the most (laughs) kevin (laughs) she felt a sharp pain in her back and then her legs gave way she didn't see anyone they tell her they posted an officer out the door so no one's gonna come in and just then someone comes in (laughs) nobody's coming in like as the door yeah all of them did like oh who's there it's like five people walked in Yeah, a bunch of nurses come in with tons and tons of flowers for Cassie. The card says, together forever, love, comma, me. Mm -hmm. Fucking Terry. Benson and Stabler run outside the room and find the delivery guy. They pretty much just attack him. Yeah. Like, ah, give give us ID. He's like, I just deliver stuff. (laughs) Yeah. He doesn't know who sent the flowers. He's just a fucking delivery guy. Benson gets a phone call. It's Munch. He says Amy is running all over the place, changed cabs twice, and finally landed in some dive in Harlem. And they go and find out what hotel room she's in. The whole gang shows up, all right? Guns mm-hmm. drawn. Munch and Toots split up and cover any escape routes Terry might take. Mm-hmm. Benson and Stabler knock on the door and Amy tells them to go away. Why does <laughs> everybody always say that? This what if they a- did? What if they just went away? <laughs> I know. I laughed so <laughs> hard. But she, she just goes, go away. And they're like, well, okay. <laughs> You know, she doesn't want to do this right now, so let's take off. Are you sure? Yeah. We came all this way. We came two blocks. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, from the, we were at the Natural History Museum. <laughs> two blocks away. 
so she unlocks the door but like doesn't open it yeah okay they open the door and come in she's got her back to them and it looks like she just got out of the shower and she's Mm -hmm. zoning the fuck out staring Mm -hmm. off while they walk in behind her and start talking as soon as i saw her face i'm like oh amy amy did it Mm -hmm. and amy killed him oh really oh yeah you knew that Oh, yeah. yeah. That she had the dead eyes of a woman who just murdered somebody. Right. I guess we've all watched Snapped enough. Yeah, that's true. She said Terry left through the window and there's an open window. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, why did you stay? And she's like, well, I had to shower. Okay. (laughs) She said that she was going to take Terry to Oklahoma so they could start a new life. But Terry, quote, wouldn't leave that horror. Oh, my God. Jesus. Amy said she warned Cassie to leave him alone. She went on about how she was the one who attacked her and cut her hair. Mm-hmm. and she is the one that shot her she's the one that did that shit with the fucking cello yep and the rat yep cassie wouldn't quote listen james has got his gun drawn this entire time well they both do i guess yeah stable looks on the ground and sees men's shoes and clothes and immediately like points to a, a closed door that's the bathroom right mm-hmm. he kicks it open and there's blood everywhere terry's fucked up dead on the floor it's some dexter type blood splatter shit everywhere yeah 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 she brutally murdered yeah him. amy says that she didn't know what else to do terry is all that she has yeah and that's it and she's still blaming cassie at the end of it she's like yeah she had all those men that whore i warned her bitch she didn't know who terry was yeah and i know you're not well either but oof, yeah. oof. So there's actually an episode of Law and Order Regular partially based on the case that I'm about to tell you about. Um, It's season Mm. two, episode 12, Starstruck. But I felt like this applied to our episode because of the impact that it had on anti-stalking laws, um, which they continuously talk about through the entire SVU episode. And the fact that there's very little, if any, protection for victims of stalking. Also, Mm. there's quite a few parallels in the thought processes of the perpetrators here. So... Rebecca Lucille Schaefer was born November 6, 1967 in Portland, Oregon. She was the only child of her parents, Benson and Dana. Mm -hmm. Her dad's name was Benson. She was a well-behaved kid and very well-liked. She was active in the drama program at school. She really felt like she wanted to pursue acting. But then at 14, someone said, hold on now, you little cutie patootie. You should try modeling. Mm. She's like, okay. She immediately got a bunch of local gigs. Everybody that talked about her was like, she was so easygoing. She was so down to earth. All of these wonderful things. She lit up a room. By 1984, she had convinced her parents to let her move across the country to New York by herself to pursue a modeling career. She was 16 at this time. While they there, she was also going to auditions and shit for acting, which ended up being the route she would go because she was just fucking good at it. And she had something about her that got her gigs. People liked her. So she got on Guiding Light with a short term role. Later that year, she landed a six month mm. spot on One Life to Live, another daytime soap. She eventually mm-hmm. made her way to L.A. since it was her acting that was really getting her these jobs. Like I said, after her role on One Life to Live finished up, Rebecca landed a leading role in a new primetime show called My my sister Sam. The show was a huge hit right away. She starred opposite Pam Dauber from Mork and Mindy and they had an insanely great time slot so the ratings crushed. Her star just shot up into the atmosphere. Rebecca even landed on the cover of the 1987 March issue of Seventeen magazine which was a huge deal for a teenage girl. You know that's basically like Mm -hmm. I saw this thing that was like that was like a woman getting on the cover of Vogue. It was just yeah. She and Pam Dauber were also on the cover of TV Guide which at the time was insane. TV Guide at that time had 40 million readers nationwide. Mm -hmm. She had all these adults looking out for her and caring for her. She made friends easily and had a lot of them. She had a serious boyfriend. She even lived with Pam Dauber for a time. And they all said the same thing. Rebecca didn't consider herself a celebrity or concern herself with being famous. She was that down to earth. The people she associated with that had experience with fame noticed this. And although it's a great quality to have this humility and everything, they saw the naivete that accompanied it as well. Pam Dauber once told her, you never put your real name on your mailbox. Mm -hmm. She told her this out of her own experience with stalkers. She herself to this day doesn't even have her address on her driver's license. Pam Dauber, that is. I don't know. Maybe she puts a P.O. box or something just for Yeah, or there's like some special allowance or something. Rebecca didn't see an issue with personally responding to fan mail either. She just thought it was nice. She was like, I want to make these connections with people. But she was encouraged to just send back an autographed photo instead, you know, to just kind of like keep some sort of a distance there. But Rebecca wanted her fans to feel seen by her. And as we know, Mm -hmm. this can be really dangerous. So one day at peak My Sister Sam popularity, Rebecca and her friend Sue Cameron were on set 
set in Rebecca's trailer when security called. They said there was a man at the gate with gifts for her and he had told security that he knew her. Rebecca told them she wasn't expecting anyone and so they were like, all right, well, we're going to send him away. And she went on about her day, thought nothing of it. By the second season of My Sister Sam, the network had moved the show to Saturday night. That time slot put them against the facts of life, which killed their fucking ratings. And the Mm -hmm. show was canceled in April of 1988. She went on to have supporting roles in movies for the following years, uh, including scenes from the class struggle in Beverly Hills, The End of Innocence, and TV movies Out of Time and Voyage of Terror. By the time Rebecca was 21, her career was going well as she continued to work and get noticed. Unfortunately, she had been noticed by some... I feel like this is a really Keith Morrison way of saying this. Unfortunately, she had already been noticed by Robert John Bardo. Hmm. Robert John Bardo was born January 2nd, 1970. He was the youngest of seven kids and had a pretty rough childhood. After being abused by his sibling, he had threatened suicide and as a result was placed in foster care. He was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and by 15 had been institutionalized to treat, quote, emotional problems. By the ninth grade, Bardo had dropped out of school and got a job as a janitor at Jack in the Box. He seemed to have volatile relationships with everyone around him, threatening people, etc. By the time he was through his teens, he had been arrested three times with charges like disorderly conduct and domestic violence. He discovered Mm. Rebecca Schaefer while she was starring in My Sister Sam. He sent her a ton of letters. She sent him an autographed Mm. photo back with a note that said that, quote, yours was one of the nicest I got, meaning letters, messages. Yeah. Criminal psychologist Dr. Michelle Ward said this, quote, in Bardo's mind, this letter and this picture confirmed for him what he had been believing or hoping that she reciprocates these feelings for him. Right. Just like in the episode when Huang was like, all it takes is a smile or a nod, like nothing. And that yeah. person latches on to that. Right. And that that like makes people feel like it's their fault. And you're like, no. Right. You can smile and nod at somebody or open a door for somebody to do whatever and not. It's not your fault that you're getting stopped. It's, right. Yeah. Right. And yeah, that's I do not want it to sound like I'm victim blaming in any way. Like it was her fault for wanting to connect with fans. It's not. Yeah. It was just people that have had more experience with it were like, hey, this can be unsafe. Oh, yeah. I wasn't I wasn't saying that. Oh, no. But I mean, it just it just made me think like, oh, maybe I should clarify that. So obviously the dude that had gone to the security gate was Bardo. He tried again a month later, a month after the first time he went to the lot, this time with a knife and security was like, dude, bye, leave. Yeah. Then, when Bardo saw Rebecca's pretty tame sex scene in scenes from the class struggle in Beverly Hills, he was Mm -hmm. pissed. He would later say that she had, quote, lost her innocence and become, quote, another Hollywood whore. When really she had taken that role, obviously that's not true, but um, she had intentionally taken that role, which painted her a little bit different than this, you know, sweet little spunky innocent girl that she was in My Sister Sam because she was trying to expand her her range. range. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. Clinical police and forensic psychologist Dr. Chris Mahandi commented on this saying, quote, all those rageful feelings. How dare she? She's mine. She's supposed to stay innocent for me. I'm going to punish you and permanently possess you by taking your life. Learning that Arthur Richard Jackson had stalked and stabbed Teresa Saldana, who was in Raging Bull. She was in a bunch of other shit, but like she was really known for being in Raging Bull opposite Robert De Niro. Do like all the women in Robert De Niro movies in the fucking 70s, 80s get stalked by somebody? (gasps) Because remember Jody Foster that was one of the things that you Uh so Teresa Saldana had been stalked and stabbed by Arthur Richard Jackson the way he gained access to her is he used a private investigator to get her address Bardo saw this the news about it and decided that he was going to do the same thing side note about how awesome Teresa Saldana was she survived the insane stabbing attack and went on to play herself in the movie victims for victims about the whole thing shit Holy shit. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. So Bardo paid a PI $250 to obtain Rebecca's home address for him, which was super easy through the California DMV. This PI went to the DMV. Remember, this is decades upon decades ago. So he had to physically go to the DMV, pay five or ten dollars, and he was given her private address. Yeah. Bardo then convinced his brother Edward to buy a Ruger handgun for him. Bardo's history of mental illness prevented him from being able to buy it himself. He went to the gun Hmm. store. Is that what it's called? Is it called a gun store? I think so. 
And the guy was like, yeah, you seem fucking off, bro. He was like, yeah, I have a history of mental illness. And the guy's like, yeah, I'm not going to sell you a gun. The shop owner went as far as putting up photos of Bardo to make sure that nobody sold him a gun. Like his shop didn't sell him a gun. Well, Bardo just got Mm -hmm. his brother to do it. Okay, so this whole thing, the stalking, the messages, the attempts to see her, it had been going on for three years. Three years he'd been tracking her, stalking her, living in a fantasy world that he created. One entry in his diary said that, quote, I have an obsession with the unattainable and I need to destroy that which I cannot obtain. Okay. On the morning of July 18th, 1989, Rebecca was waiting for a delivery. She had gotten an audition for The Godfather Part 3 to play the Corleone's daughter, which was a huge oh, fucking part. That was going to be huge. Yeah. yeah oh, that would be huge. Everybody wanted that fucking part. So yeah. she had a meeting that afternoon with Francis Ford Coppola. Okay. And no, <sighs> I know. So she was waiting for a courier to deliver this script so she could look it over. So she's like all pumped and excited. Meanwhile, 19-year-old Bardo had taken a bus to L.A. from Tucson and was headed to Rebecca's. Doorbell rings. Okay, her intercom isn't working in her apartment, so she can't buzz to see who's at the door. She has to go down to the door. When she answered the door of her apartment on Sweetser Avenue in West Hollywood, he introduced himself and told her he was her biggest fan. He showed her the card and autograph he had gotten from her. Rebecca was polite and gracious, which she did not need to be. And kindly turned him away, saying that she had an interview to go to. She shook his hand, was like, thanks, bye. This guy could not feign an air of, like... Chill? Not Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like, you could tell that he was volatile. So Bardo left and went down the street to a diner for breakfast. About an hour later, he returned to Rebecca's place, again, going to her door. The intercom was broken. She's still waiting for this script. So she's like, I have to go answer the fucking door. She's unaware who's there. And when she answered it, Bardo pulled a gun from his waistband and shot her point blank in the chest right there in the doorway. Bardo later said this to psychiatrist Dr. Park Dietz. Quote, she was screaming. She was going, why, why? I was still fumbling around thinking I should blow my head off and fall on her her. But Bardo ultimately fled and Rebecca's neighbor called 911 to have her rush to the ER at Cedar sinai 30 minutes later, she was pronounced dead. Jesus fucking Christ. Bardo was found and arrested in Tucson, Arizona the next day after police received reports of a dude wandering in freeway traffic screaming, I killed Rebecca Schaefer. Okay. So yeah, they, they went and picked him up. He confess he was already confessing the prosecutor in the case fucking marcia clark is that from oj oj simpson trial marcia clark yes oh whoa um in this trial marcia clark's task was to prove intent he admitted to shooting rebecca but was he capable of that kind of premeditation the defense argued he couldn't by reason of mental defect she argued that bardo wasn't insane he was obsessed The prosecution really wanted life without parole. So in exchange for scratching a jury trial, the prosecution took the death penalty off the table. This meant it would be decided by one person, Judge Dino Fulgoni. Something that was really interesting and bone chilling about the whole trial was that one of the claims was that uh the u2 song exit influenced him to commit the murder he kind of claimed that it was not speaking to him but in a way speaking to him right. so there's video footage of his trial and he uh is all but catatonic during this trial and then they mm-hmm. play that song in the courtroom and he is jamming out super hard lip syncing to this song really staccato like body movements and stuff but the rest of the time he was completely deadpan staring it was disturbing to Mm. say the least so another thing that he did was and this all goes to prove intent he was carrying a paperback copy of catcher in the rye when he murdered rebecca just Mm. like mark david chapman did when he shot lennon bardo claimed that it was a coincidence but later chapman said that bardo had written him letters before murdering rebecca asking about prison Hmm. If you're not taking a ninth grade English class, you don't need to be carrying around Catcher in the Rye. Just don't. Yeah. I don't even remember it. I don't know if I ever read it because I dropped it I out. don't remember it. I remember reading it because I remember like the school copy that I got, the hardcover school copy. In 1991, Bardo was found guilty of 
first degree murder and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. The only big news for him since then was a prison stabbing committed against him. He was stabbed 11 times in 2007, which resulted in some pretty serious injuries, but he recovered. Now he's at the Avenal State Prison in Avenal, California. Mm -hmm. Some things to come out of this tragedy included the DMV is now restricted from sharing personal information. You can't just go to the DMV and get somebody's home address. Yeah. In 1991, LAPD created the Threat Management Unit, which is a unit for high profile people that are stalking victims. So it's your Jennifer Aniston's waking up and somebody being in her house kind of shit. I don't know if that's happened to her. I know it happened to Brad Pitt. But like, can you imagine? Oh, that just sounds... Mm-mm. And it's such bullshit that it takes hindsight for things to fucking change like we had talked about earlier. But in 1990, a year after Rebecca's death, her murder led to the passage of the very first anti-stalking laws in the U.S., which states that it is, quote, a felony to cause another or their family to be in reasonable fear for their safety and carries a state prison sentence. That law is now recognized in all 50 states. Good fuck. Yeah. I didn't know about that. I hate it. Yeah, it's fucking awful. All right. Next week, we got season three, episode 18, Guilt. When one difficulty after another hinders the prosecution of a serial pedophile, Cabot oversteps the bounds of law, risking both her job and Benson and Stabler's to put this dangerous man behind bars. Oh, my God. Okay, first of all, I hate that we have to deal with pedophile shit. Second of Mm -hmm. all, did they push Cabot to the limit? Oh, she has to get away from the SVU. Yeah, she does. Anyway, follow us on all social media at SVU Pod. Join our Facebook group, SVU Pod Elite Squad. Hashtag little bit loud or search hashtag little bit loud if you're looking for small indie podcast shit. Yeah. It's a way for us to stick together and for people to find us. Supporting each other, being really great. I love all the podcasts that do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, join our Patreon. We've got all kinds of shit. Go check it out. There's discounts on merch. There's extra episodes. There's bonus shit. There's extra content on regular episodes. It's a bunch of stuff. And we love you. And we appreciate your support. Yeah. I think that's it. I love you. Bye. 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 I said apparently like a million times in this whole thing. I can, I'm looking right now and there's like three coming up. I'm yeah. not doing this. Yeah, don't do that. So Toots is glad. Toots. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can do it tonight or something. Well, I after my gang bang. What did you say? Did you say after my gang bang? <laughs> yeah, <I was> just... <laughs> <laughs> you did say that. I was like, what else could it have been? Special thanks to our Elite Squad patrons. Haley K. Sonia W. Jenny S. Sky K. Nikki B. Marissa M. Elky H. Sarah A. Anna G. Mary J. Andrew. Rebecca J. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll chill out. Miranda B. <laughs> Shelby W. Lex. Emily T. Kayla W. Mallory G. Eliza W. Bonita R. Marin. <laughs> Vanessa. Amy P. Yes, M. Summer M. <laughs> Melanie G. Courtney W. Ursula S. Emily A. Katrina C. He. Kate H. Uyunga. <laughs> I found myself the other day, I, I was trying to, because I love that Uyunga sent us the pronunciation spelled out like that. It's one of those things that loops in my head. So I'm like settling down in bed and I just go out loud, Uyunga to myself. Uyunga. Also, Nicole R and Julia P. We appreciate you guys and you're helping us make this happen and we love you. We love you. Brrr.